pleasure and an honor to have everybody here today, especially our two very distinguished guests. I'm Leslie Vinjamori. I direct the US and America's program at Chatham House. Um, and we are, of course, having some really tremendously productive conversations, I think, in the last several weeks, all things being as they are. It's been, it's been fantastic. And I, I have to say, for those of you who volunteered yourselves to come on with video, I am especially appreciative because I don't know about everybody else, but I miss seeing everybody. And so for me, this is really quite a highlight. It's also such an honor to be able to meet um, from myself for the first time, Tony Blinken, who uh, is many things to all of us and certainly to the United States of America. He's currently senior advisor um, on the Biden for president um, campaign. He was U.S. Deputy Secretary of State 2015 uh, to 2017. He was previously U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor um, and is currently uh, a managing director, managing partner at uh, West Exec Advisors. Um, Tony is going to be in conversation with a, um, another distinguished guest who's also a dear colleague of mine. Uh, at Chatham House on the U.S. and Americas program, that's Sir Peter Westmacott, who served as British ambassador uh, in Turkey and France. And most importantly for this conversation, and most importantly uh, to me, uh, to, the, to the United States, and, um, and for this conversation, it's very important because he and Tony, of course, overlapped, and I'm sure worked together. And it was at Peter's suggestion that we reached out to you, Tony, and I'm sure that that was a big part of your reason for giving us your time um, to speak about U.S. foreign policy in a post-COVID world. There's certainly plenty to say, and I think you're very, uh, very well steeped in these conversations with your colleagues on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to really matter anymore what side of the Atlantic we're on. There's no advantage in geography in the current moment, um, which I think is a nice thing for many of us. Um, but um, you're, you're clearly very steeped, and you, you know that people here are very concerned about where America is, what America's role will be going forward, whether we can expect um, consistent, concerted, inspired, and invested leadership in the months ahead, and especially uh, in the year that, that comes after this one. So I'll turn it over to, um, to you, Sir Peter, to have this conversation, and, and we will, of course, have quite a lot of time for all of you to ask questions. Uh, Sir Peter. Uh, Leslie, thank you very much, and Tony, welcome. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, for those who don't know, Tony was, of course, uh, Vice President Biden's National Security Advisor before he went on to be Deputy Secretary of State, so I thought that he was as well-placed as anybody who could tell us in due course what sort of a president uh, Joe Biden would be in the event that that was the choice of the American people in November. But in the meantime, Tony, I thought perhaps we might kick off with a little bit of a discussion of how uh, America is now seen in the rest of the world, what mm. you feel from where you are has happened to America's leadership, leaving aside the fact that before the pandemic began, there was already talk about, well, what's, how is America treating its allies on issues of trade and defense and foreign policy mm. in Iran and Middle East? I and mean, all that is, in a sense, out there, but a little bit in the past. But now we're reading stuff, even in America, about the United States being a failed state and the world should take pity on rather than respect and be fearful of the United States. How does it look from where you are uh, about America's leading role, what was traditionally the leading role America was playing uh, in this world? Peter, thank you. And, and first, before we get started, let me just say thank you to, to you, to Leslie. It's wonderful uh, to be with Chatham House. Um, it's always wonderful to be with you, Peter. We've had uh, many great conversations in the past. I don't know if we can live up to our standard, but we'll try. <laughs> we'll try. Uh, okay. uh, but I also, I just want to applaud, uh, Leslie, what you're doing, because continuing uh, to have these conversations, continuing to bring people together, even virtually, I think is more important than ever. Uh, we all obviously feel the physical distance in our day-in, day-out lives, and looking for ways to continue to have community, to continue to be able to talk, discuss, debate, uh, these issues that are defining our lives, I think, is more important than ever. So your role, even in, in these strange times, uh, is uh, as vital, if not more vital, than it's ever been. So thank you for, for convening us. And Peter, thank you for, uh, for sitting down and doing this. And thanks to everyone for being there. I just hope my, my, my fondest wish for everyone participating this morning is that you are all safe and well, and your families and loved ones are uh, as well. Um, so this is a, a strange time in many ways. And I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be blunt. I think there is a perception uh, grounded in a fair bit of reality, 
that the United States is uh, absent without leave, uh, AWOL, when it comes to uh, leading in this crisis and particularly in the inter international arena. You know, Peter, I think back to uh, crises past that were international and even global in nature. Um, HIV AIDS, 9-11, uh, uh, and then of course the 2008-2009 financial crisis. One of the common elements through Republican and Democratic administrations in all of those crises was U.S. engagement, U.S. leadership, trying to uh, bring the international community along to find a collective response to this new challenge. Uh, the Bush administration, to its great credit, uh, produced the um, uh, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Program, uh, to combat HIV-AIDS, uh, as well as the, uh, the Global Fund, uh, saving millions of lives. Um, after 9-11, we were the ones who brought the world together uh, at, through the G7, G8, uh, the G20, uh, to uh, develop uh, new security standards, for example. And then, of course, 2008, 2009, absent the uh, leadership of the United States in producing a coordinated uh, response to the crisis, I think things would have been far worse. The recovery would have been far slower. Countries would have emerged far later. Um, that's been absent in, in, in this crisis. And, of course, it's understandable to some extent that people are focused inward, that they're looking uh, to themselves at home. But by the very nature of this crisis, uh, we will not succeed absent finding ways to work it together, both on the health side of the equation and on the economic side, as hopefully uh, we head to uh, recovery. So uh, what I'm hearing certainly from conversations with people around the world is that uh, we're not there. I'll give you just one quick example. Um, as it happened, when the crisis broke out, um, we were uh, in the chair of the G7. You would think that the United States would have immediately convened an emergency session of the G7, the world's leading economies, to talk through how we could work together to uh, combat uh, the virus. Um, and it fell to President Macron of France, not in the chair, to convene a meeting. Um, and then we had a big argument about whether or not we should call it the uh, Wuhan or Chinese virus, and uh, any effort at having some kind of joint, even a joint statement, broke down. The G20 took months to get its act together. Uh, very little emerged from that. So it's a long way of saying, um, I think there's an absence. It's felt, uh, and it needs to be filled. And so looking ahead, how do you think it would be different if we had a different president who has been schooled, steeped even, in the pattern of cooperation with close allies that you know so well, indeed you advised Vice President Biden on when you were at the White House. Do you think it would be different? Do you think we could flip a switch and suddenly uh, we would be, if you like, back in a different era? Or do you think some things have actually changed uh, more or less permanently? Yeah. So, uh, Peter, I think you put your finger on the critical piece of this, which is, look, there is no going backwards. Um, the, the world that um, uh, a new administration would inherit in January of next year is going to be vastly different from the one, for example, uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden inherited uh, in early 2009. So the, the, idea, the, the issue is not going back to that. It is going forward. It is to uh, engage the world as we find it and as we anticipate it will become, uh, not as it was. Having said that, there's some basic principles, I think, that do remain constant uh, and that would certainly define a Biden administration if there is one. Um, first, when Joe Biden looks at the world uh, through many years of experience, I think one thing stands out, and it relates back to what we were just talking about. Whether we like it or not, uh, the world tends not to organize itself. And for 75 plus years, the United States played uh, the leading role or certainly a leading role in working to organize the world. Uh, establishing the institutions, setting the norms, writing the rules. And of course, the UK played a very prominent role in that as well. Uh, we all did this very imperfectly. <laughs> there are many mistakes we can think of along the way, many things we might wish we had done differently. But I think we all believe we got the big picture right. Um, we know this. If we're not doing it, then one of two things. Either someone else is, and probably not in a way that adv advances our interests and values, and so, for example, we see China trying to fill the void left by an abdication of U.S. leadership, or uh, no one is. And that may be just as bad, if not worse, because then you've got a vacuum, and that tends to be filled by malevolent things before it's filled by good things. So the first thing is, I think Joe Biden would um, reassert the basic principle, the basic understanding that we have a responsibility and a strong self-interest in, in leading but also with a big dose of humility, because to your point, Peter, we can't flip a switch. Many of the world's problems are not about us, even though they affect us. 
Um, and so we have to have a certain amount of humility in tackling them, but also a little bit more confidence. I still believe profoundly that the United States acting uh, at its best is a unique force to mobilize collective positive action to tackling the world's problems. That's something we've gotten away from. It's something a Biden administration would get back to. Let me just take you back a little more to what you said about China, if I may, Tony. Somebody else will fill the gap if there is a vacuum of global leadership, more or less what you were saying. And of course, we've seen China do quite a lot of that. China has been showering many other countries with some of the equipment that it needs, some of the right equipment, some of the wrong equipment, and sometimes with strings attached. And of course, it has violently resisted any suggestion there should be an independent inquiry into where the virus came from. It's been very rude about Australia, which has said it is time for us to have a proper international inquiry. They've begun very threatening noises. From the point of view of the president, President Trump, it's a combination of lots of compliments for Xi Jinping, but also a certain amount of this is China's fault, it's the Wuhan virus and mm. so on. How do you see the US-China relationship coming along at the present time as China seems to be wanting to both fill the vacuum and in many ways absolve itself respons of responsibility for a virus which has caused so much grief to the rest of the world? Yeah, I think that's extremely, extremely well put. And, and, and in fairness, uh, a lot of this, of course, predated uh, the virus. We've had uh, the challenge of thinking about how to contend and how to deal with uh, a rising China. And that's a, uh, in, in a sense, a normal um, uh, evolution uh, that um, was in the process of trying to be, uh, uh, trying to be figured out. And it's not, uh, it's not easy. It's hard. But here's the thing. I think in this particular case, uh, China is a great nation, uh, also has great responsibilities. And in particular, with the virus uh, originating uh, in China, those responsibilities included uh, transparency, sharing information, giving access to international experts in a timely fashion so that we could try to get ahead of it. And China did not live up, the Chinese government did not live up to those responsibilities. Um, it was also a time when the United States should have been pressing, uh, using the relationship, including the relationship that President Trump says he's established with President Xi, uh, to uh, insist that China live up to its responsibilities. And instead of doing that, uh, what we saw in, uh, in January and February, when the virus was starting its uh, rampage around the world, uh, was uh, the president um, complimenting China on its uh, transparency, transparency that was not <laughs> what was happening, uh, praising its cooperation at a time when the Chinese government was refusing access in China to our CDC, our Centers for Disease Control, to get experts into Wuhan to see if they could help understand uh, what had happened. Um, I think there are many reasons for this, uh, including the fact that uh, the Pre President Trump was trying to downplay uh, the virus and its dangers in the early going. He had also just signed a trade agreement with China that put an end, uh, at least temporarily, to the, the tariff war that he had initiated that was doing terrible damage to our own farmers and manufacturers and consumers. And he had an interest in making sure that that deal stuck and that the Chinese government didn't walk away from it. But for all of those reasons, um, at the very moment it was important to insist that China and its government live up to its responsibilities, President Trump walked away. Um, I think there is going to be an important moment uh, when we work hard as an international community to get to the bottom of what happened, to fully understand, so that we can uh, take measures in the future that make the outbreak of uh, such a pandemic less likely. One last thing uh, that's important. You know, uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden, understood many years ago that a pandemic was a rising uh, threat a rising danger to countries around the world, including the United States. And they also believed that uh, it was not unlikely that one would originate again in China. We, de we dealt with SARS, as you remember very well. And of course, in different ways, we'd had H1N1, we'd had Ebola. They put in place programs and people to try to help uh, uh, predict, uh, prevent, and deal with any pandemics that broke out, including in China. Uh, we had um, a very robust CDC presence in China. We had an expert embedded with the Chinese Disease Control Agency. Um, the Vice President himself, Vice President Biden, secured an agreement from China in 2013 to get our Food and Drug Administration experts in China, uh, with diplomatic immunity, by the way, um, to do things like uh, look over some of the very wet, uh, wet food markets, these uh, live animal markets, from which the virus may have originated. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, and of course, we put in place a, a White House office to deal with pandemics. Unfortunately, virtually all of that was undone 
uh, or undermined by, uh, by President Trump. And so to some extent, the defenses that we put up were taken down even before the virus emerged. You remind me that four or five years ago when you and I were in, in Washington, you were in the administration and I was the ambassador, we actually spent a lot of time talking about Ebola and how we, sh we can and yeah. should work together to contain its spread. And there's a lot that, that can and perhaps should have been learned from that. Well, you we know, did. Peter, this was, a good, this was a really good example of terrific international cooperation. Yeah. Uh, Ebola was horrific, but the fact is that we were able to work together so effectively, uh, starting with the United States and the UK, uh, other uh, countries around the world, and by the way, China uh, yes. as well very productively, and uh, we were able to contain it um, in ways that saved who knows uh, how many lives. And another area where we spent a lot of time discussing what to do was Middle East. And again, you mentioned China, but I remember sitting down with the Chinese or the Russian, the French, the German ambassadors together on Capitol Hill as co-signatories of the nuclear deal with Iran, engaging with your administration to try to ensure, in fact, that Congress did not kill that deal. That was a big part of our collaborative yeah. diplomacy, perhaps even in some ways a high mark of a high water mark of diplomatic cooperation. Now, uh, way back then, I remember President, uh, then candidate Trump, accusing President Obama uh, of going to start a war with Iran in order to get himself elected for a second term. And he, I see, is raising the stakes with Iran now, having already walked away from the nuclear deal that we all uh, carefully negotiated together. Where do you think that is going? Are we seeing a bit of wag the dog here? Are we seeing uh, foreign policy opportunities to make the president look better, if I can put it like that, at a time when the economy is obviously stalling for reasons that are not at all actually the president's fault, but, but you know, tragically affecting all of our economies? Because I think Middle East is an important part of the world. We talk about it a bit less at the moment, but those tensions are still there. There are issues between the United States and Iran. There's all the problems that are inside Iraq, a country which you know extraordinarily well, I know a little bit as well. And there are the remaining Sunni Shia divisions and tensions between the Arab countries of the southern shores of the Persian Gulf and Iran and its proxies and its friends and its alliances on the north. Uh, what about all that at the moment? Do you see that as a continuing cause for concern or do you think that the world at the moment is keeping a lid on all that kind of thing precisely because of the, uh, the appalling trauma of COVID? Uh, Peter, I think this may be one of the most dangerous periods in uh, international relations and in the world for our uh, joint security uh, interests, uh, maybe more than I can think of in any, any recent time in, uh, in, in history. There are a whole series of non-COVID dogs that could very well start barking mm -hmm. in the months ahead. And just as we are um, AWOL in terms of international leadership in combating the virus, so too, many of these problems are being left uh, unattended, or in some cases, like the case of Iran, I would argue being made worse and thus more likely to create a crisis or a conflict. Um, in the case of Iran, as you were saying, look, I think uh, this is one of the uh, most significant achievements of the Obama-Biden administration, and the role that you played and that the um, other uh, leading ambassadors in Washington played was, uh, was instrumental, I think, because Congress heard directly from you uh, from your French and German counterparts, uh, the importance of this issue uh, to uh, our closest partners and allies, and uh, as well, uh, an understanding that they were seeing things in very much the same way that we were. When President Trump decided to pull out of the, um, the JCPOA, the agreement with Iran, the consequences were predicted, and uh, indeed, uh, virtually everything that we were concerned about has now come to pass. The president said at the time that by pulling out of the agreement and then exerting what, uh, they, what he called maximum pressure on Iran, two things would happen. The Iranians would come back to the table to negotiate a better deal, and their malign activities uh, in the region uh, would cease or at least significantly diminish. As predicted, exactly the opposite has happened. The idea that uh, Iran was going to take this without reacting in some way was absurd on its face. And so what have we seen? Um, ever since the um, agreement was torn up by the United States, uh, Iran has started slowly to restart dangerous aspects of its nuclear program that had been curbed by the agreement and has been acting uh, with uh, more and more impunity uh, in the region in ways that are profoundly dangerous. And of course, we had the also predictable um, sort of uh, spiral up in tensions with um, one move by the United States, another move by Iran, back and forth, back and forth, culminating in the killing of Qasem Soleimani, 
Um, no one's shedding any tears over his demise, but the question really is, what are the consequences of taking these actions? Um, has uh, deterrence been restored with Iran? Uh, no, exactly the opposite. It's acting in ever more dangerous ways. And this, of course, is all before the virus broke out. Uh, and the nuclear program is now moving back in the direction that we stopped and reversed with the nuclear agreement. And that puts us back potentially at a place at some point in which we're faced with the terrible choice we faced before getting the nuclear agreement was either letting Iran go forward to a point where it can have a nuclear weapon on very short order, the fissile material for a weapon, very, very quickly, uh, or um, take some kind of military action that could have uh, terrible unintended consequences. Um, and so I think on its own terms, the policy pursued by President Trump has been uh, a failure, and it's made the region more dangerous, not less dangerous, uh, for U.S. interests. Thank you for that, Tony. I'm looking at my clock, and I know quite soon Leslie's going to say there's so many interesting people with interesting questions that we're going to throw up on the discussion. But can I take you back just for a moment to domestic politics before, before we do that? Um, on the 3rd of November, and I assume that there isn't any question of that date slipping because of coronavirus and voter problems or all the other technical issues that those of us who are American political nerds are aware of, uh, what do you think is going to happen then? And do you think that the Senate is in play? The House of Representatives, I assume, is going to remain much as it is. Of course, you are totally unbiased as an observer, <laughs> even though you're a senior advisor of Biden for president. But I think people would love to hear a little bit your take of how things look. And to what extent the domestic politics and the prospects of the election mm -hmm. have actually been affected by the, the, the dramas of the last couple of months? Well, Peter, you know, let's pause on that for a second, because I think it's very, very important. Um, we have to conduct a democratic and safe election in November. And there's absolutely no reason why we can't do that and shouldn't do that effectively. Um, if you look uh, in Asia uh, right now um, and take a look at what just happened in South Korea about uh, 10 days ago, they conducted national elections in the midst of, um, of the virus. They conducted them safely. They conducted them democratically. They took certain measures to make sure that that could happen. Uh, including uh, uh, making sure that there was uh, much more early voting and that it was spaced out, that the polling places themselves were designed in a way uh, that was safe with the appropriate distancing, uh, et cetera. There is absolutely no reason why uh, in the United States uh, we can't and shouldn't right now be doing the same thing, taking very active measures to make sure that the polling in November goes forward in a safe and democratic way. Uh, right in voting, uh, which is already on the books in most of the critical states. We need to make sure the resources are in place to accommodate that. Stretching out the early voting times, again, so that uh, we don't have large concentrations of people. And then for those who decide to vote um, on uh, the day of the election itself, uh, make sure that the, uh, the polling places are uh, designed in the right way uh, and are safe. All of that eminently doable. You would think that the President of the United States would be leading in a nonpartisan way uh, a national effort to make sure that that was happening, uh, encouraging the governors and state legislatures to take the steps that they need to take, making sure that federal resources were in place as needed to bolster these state efforts. And of course, none of that is happening. Um, and so uh, we really, I think, need to uh, make this a national priority uh, throughout our history in the most difficult times, including the Civil War, uh, elections went forward uh, it is the very foundation of the democracy that we are all sworn to uh, defend and protect. As to what happens on November 3rd, <laughs> after 2016, I've given up making predictions. Uh, but I will say this. My own sense is that um, the country is hungry for, uh, for a few things. Um, it's hungry for some basic competence in its leadership. Um, it's hungry for someone who is going to be able to deal with a country that unfortunately is divided and a world that is increasingly uh, in disarray. Uh, it's hungry for someone who can bring a sense of basic decency and empathy back into, into governing. Uh, someone who understands what people are experiencing and going through in their day in, uh, day out lives. Um, and I think as people are hungry for that, um, the choice before them is pretty clear and the answer is pretty obvious. <laughs>
Uh, very discreet. Tony, thank you. There's loads more we could talk about. For example, what sort of a reset might there be with Russia, which has been obviously a very mm. important foreign policy issue uh, during this presidency. But I think probably our private time, if I can call it that, is up. And I think I have to hand control back to Leslie, who will sift through a number of questions and comments and throw them back at you, probably not at me. Uh, but Leslie, over to you. Let's see. Yeah, I'm you, know, try. you know, the, the brilliant thing about having the two of you, you know each other very well, you've worked together, you've clearly stayed in touch and had conversations. So it, it is really nice to, for us to see the dynamic. Mm. It's not a very private conversation. We have well over 100 people uh, on this call and, and it's of course live streamed. We're on the record. When you ask a question, please say your name and tell us your affiliation and the relevant one. Because um, sometimes people, you know, tell us, for example, Sir David Manning, that, you know, tell us your relevant, uh, your relevant affiliation when, because we all know you, but, but not everybody on the call does. And it really, it alters our understanding of where you're coming from if we understand where in the world you made your um, most significant interventions on, on these issues. I want to start with a quick first question, and then we have several people on the list, so I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, and in fact, I think I'll, I'll give you my question, and then I'll come to Lee Lukens, because I think we have maybe two sides of a, of a, of a similar question. And mine is, um, you know, as an American who's lived in the UK for, for now, just over a decade, um, I, I do sort of hear, through, hear things in the way that translators do, right, through multiple channels and, and read them in a particular way. And one of the things that, you know, we are hearing, and I'm sure you're hearing in spades uh, from many, and by no means all people in the UK, many people in Europe, is, is, a, is a deep concern that America is going off the rails with respect to its um, read of China and how to engage or perhaps not engage productively with China. There are certainly plenty of people, um, and this includes those people who clearly would like to see Joe Biden elected to be president, uh, but nonetheless have a concern that perhaps a Democratic administration led by Joe Biden might be even tougher on China and in a more serious way than, um, than what we might see from a, a second Trump administration. And there's grave concern that Europe will be forced to make a choice that America won't be productive in the ways that we need it to be productive. And I guess I'm curious, um, you know, what your answer is to that and, and whether you see nuance, not only in the debate amongst foreign policy elites, but also in the public debate and the public perception of, of China. We hear there's a generational divide we hear all sorts of things, but you know, what is, what is your take on that? But before you answer, let me come to Lou Lukens, because I think he might have um, a question that carries on that, in that vein. If you introduce mm -hmm. yourself and unmute yourself. Thanks, Leslie and Sir Peter and Tony, thanks so much. Um, I'm Lou Lukens, I'm a member of Chatham House, was a diplomat, US diplomat for 30 years, served five presidents and retired about a year ago. Um, my concern, Tony, is, is around China and the election, and China seems to be becoming sort of the bully boy that both sides in this election want to show that they are really tough on. And my concern is you're the potential for long-term damage to the U.S.-China relationship more than there is already, and how a new administration would then be prepared to kind of walk back on tough rhetoric for over the next six or seven months and then suddenly have to deal with this you know, incredibly important trading partner and geopolitical partner. Um, after a period of, you know, the next couple of months where I think we'll see both sides talking pretty tough on China for, for domestic political reasons. Thank you. Uh, Tony, don't answer that yet, because first of all, mm -hmm. my, my goodness, we have so many questions. It's, it's quite extraordinary. I haven't seen this before. Uh, but I know for sure that we have one more on China. I'm sure we have okay. many, and that's from our chairman, Jim O'Neill. Jim, if you can introduce yourself again with, with the affiliation in addition to Chatham House that might be most relevant. In, in addition to Chatham House, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Manchester United fan. I'm <laughs> a Chatham House. I guess, uh, thank you very much, Tony, for being with us and sharing your thoughts. And, and to you, Peter. Um, in addition or, or linked to what the other two questions were, I, f I find myself wondering whether a, a lot of this uh, broad anti-China issue in the US is, is easy to present because of their political uh, state. 
But it, my question is, is that is that actually possibly a bit of a red herring? And it turns out the US just basically doesn't like any country that might be bigger than it. I <laughs> lived in the States uh, twice the first time when, when it was briefly fashionable to believe that Japan might overtake the States. Uh, and we did the same breadth of issues, but certainly plenty of them. And I, I wonder what you think about that. And, and, and with it more importantly, how you think uh, a Biden administration would deal with that? So yeah, these are these are these are great questions, and I think they they, they cut to the heart of arguably uh, the most important question, uh, uh, or certainly one of the most important questions a new administration would have to uh, to deal with, uh, simply because there's no more important relationship in the world than the relationship between the United States and China. It, it will, in many ways, uh, shape the uh, the next decades, uh, and so we have an imperative to try uh, to get it right. But of course, it takes two to get it right. Uh, we can't will it uh, that way. Um, we have to find ways. Uh, to work together to make it right. Look, from, from my perspective, um, what we've seen is uh, a couple of things. Uh, we used to talk about the relationship with China uh, as sort of moving back and forth between uh, two shoals, uh, one competition, the other cooperation. Uh, and competition, if it's fair, uh, is a good thing. Hopefully it draws out the best. Uh, and there were problems, of course, that have become accentuated over the years in a lack of fairness, a lack of reciprocity, particularly when it came to economic competition in the way China was treating us and treating the, treating the world. So that was one set of issues. And then the other shoal, of course, was cooperation. It makes sense for uh, the two, le two leading countries in the world to try to find ways to work together on common challenges. Good for us, good for everyone else. And indeed, we were working to do that. This has now shifted for a variety of reasons, um, at least under the, the Trump administration, to uh, veering wildly back and forth between confrontation and abdication. Uh, confrontation uh, over the, uh, the trade issues, but confrontation not conducted, in my judgment, in a smart way. Uh, and then abdication, as we were talking about earlier, uh, of the United States' role in uh, working with, sustaining, uh, cooperating with our own allies, uh, building up international institutions, engaging in them, uh, working to establish the rules and norms uh, that shape those institutions. And with that abdication has come an opening uh, that China is only too willing to try to, uh, to fill. Um, so where I think we need to go is, is, is this, uh, and I was alluding to this early, earlier. Uh, China as a great country has great responsibilities. Um, many years ago, Bob Zellick, uh, one of my predecessors as Deputy Secretary of State, among many other things, you know, coined the, the famous uh, responsible stakeholder term. Um, and there's still something profoundly important about that. Um, I think one of what we should be expecting of China is that it actually act as a responsible stakeholder in ways commensurate uh, with its, um, its rising power. And when it doesn't do that, uh, to, um, uh, to hold the government to account. But to hold it to account um, in ways vastly different than what we've seen in the last two or three years. Um, for example, when we're dealing with some of China's economic excesses, uh, and some of the um, uh, ways it, uh, in, in my judgment at least, abuses the international system for its own, uh, to its own advantage. If the United States is um, pushing back against that alone, we're about 25% of the world's GDP. When we're pushing back together with similarly situated countries, the other democracies that have the same kinds of problems, that's 50% or more of the world's GDP. That's a lot harder for the government in China uh, to ignore. And we've had some success in the past when we've actually worked together. But what we've seen over the last two or three years is of course, uh, President Trump taking uh, his uh, tariff wars to our partners, not just to, uh, to China, and making it much more difficult for us to be working together in common cause to uh, engage China in a way that gets it to act up to its responsibilities. So that's, um, that's one thing uh, that should change. Second, um, again, I think the United States showing up again uh, in these institutions uh, making clear that, uh, we, that we will play a leadership role, uh, that makes uh, a big difference too, instead of going AWOL. And then finally, uh, there are ways of advancing uh, your interests that uh, can also continue to advance the relationship. Let me give you one quick example. Um, during the Obama-Biden administration, at one point, uh, the Chinese government unilaterally declared uh, a, a so-called air defense identification zone, saying that planes flying through that zone, despite the fact it was an in international airspace, had to identify themselves uh, and in effect uh, get permission. 
uh, then Vice President Biden went to Beijing, went to see Xi Jinping, with whom he developed a substantial relationship, and I'll come back to that in one second, and said privately to him, very simply, uh, we uh, are not going to respect the air de defense identification zone you've established. Uh, we consider it null and void, and I'm just telling you, this is not a threat, but just telling you that we're going to fly our bombers through it, uh, and that's that, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, but we didn't make a big uh, deal out of it publicly. We simply told um, the government what we were going to do, uh, and uh, ultimately they had to respect that fact. Uh, the vice president, when Xi Jinping was also vice president, um, spent a lot of time with him. Um, we knew he was going to become the president of China, but he was still vice president, and it wasn't appropriate for President Obama to engage him at that stage. So Vice President Biden went off to China. We spent about a week there uh, with, uh, with Xi Jinping, both in, uh, in Beijing, but also in Chengdu. Uh, there was a return visit uh, some months later where we were together in Washington and then out in California. And, you know, the vice president spent a lot of time with Xi and I think um, was um, effective in, in drawing him out to some extent in very lengthy conversations and also sizing him up. So there's already uh, a pre-existing relationship uh, working together through some difficult problems, being very direct with, um, uh, with Beijing, but also trying to find ways to, uh, to cooperate. Um, my sense is that if we're working together with our partners, if we are insisting that um, Beijing live up to its responsibilities, uh, we're going to get a lot further than this almost schizophrenic uh, veering back and forth between confrontation and abdication that we've seen over the last two or three years. Great. Okay. So again, many people on the list. I'm going to take three. Um, Sanam uh, Robin, our director, and, um, and Gideon. And again, if you introduce yourself, not that any of these three individuals need an introduction, but we appreciate it. Sanam. Hello, my name is Sanam Vakil. I'm a senior research fellow at Chatham House's Middle East North Africa program, and I work on both sides of the Gulf. And I wanted uh, to, first of all, thank you uh, for your time and also to Sir Peter, um, but also uh, take you back to your comments on the issue of Iran, maximum pressure and the JCPOA, um, and press you a bit more. I think you've um, really captured the challenges of maximum pressure, the danger of this moment in the coming months um, where uh, there could be uh, more activity, um, kinetic activity, as sanctions continue to bear down on Iran. Um, but there is an expectation, both in Tehran and I think in a number of European capitals, that perhaps a, a Biden president um, would return to the JCPOA. And there is hope um, that uh, an easy uh, U.S. entry, re-entry would uh, solve all of the problems. Um, but I think that uh, what we have seen um, over the past two years is that regional issues continue unabated, as you've pointed out, and tensions with the Arab Gulf states and Israel are also ongoing. So um, to, to get to the point, uh, what is the plan vis-a-vis -vis the JCPOA? Uh, would there be an effort to redress some of the regional challenges and bring in um, the Arab Gulf and Israel as partners to uh, a JCPOA 2.0 or a potentially new deal. Yeah. So now, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry honey, I'm going to I'm going to make you wait. Unfortunately, sure. it's it's very unfair because that was a very important and very big question. But Robin is next. Honey, great to see you. Thank you very much. Hey, for Robin. A long time to see, but. Good to see you. Um, Great to have you with us, and uh, uh, also on behalf, obviously, as Leslie, all our colleagues, thrilled that you'd come and uh, spend some time between your various Zoom calls with, with all of us at Chatham House. Um, quickly to the question, this is going to be a, a big question list, and uh, Peter was getting to it just at the end of his uh, remarks. Russia, um, obviously, President Putin, uh, sadly for himself, had to put off his great confirmatory referendum because of COVID, but he could be <laughs> president through to 2036. So this, you know, that's quite a different framework to think about. And I'm just wondering, having been part of an administration that did try to reset a relationship a while ago, uh, when you see that he's likely to be around as long as he possibly could be, uh, if a Biden presidency were to uh, get into power, um, you know, where does Russia fit into the mix, especially with uh, the situation in China being that much more, um, uh, uh, you know, unpredictable than it was before? I'd love to know your thoughts on uh, how you see Russia. What leverage could there possibly be to change the nature of that relationship? Thank you. Right. Okay, Tony, Thanks, now that you have both 
you know, Russia and Iran, maybe you should take those two. And then I'm going to come to Gideon and Trisha because they, I think their, their questions are in a, in a similar vein. So go Great. Ahead. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so let, let, let's start with, uh, with Iran. Um, if uh, there is a, uh, a Biden administration and if uh, during that administration, the Iranians come back into full compliance with their obligations under the nuclear agreement, uh, then um, Vice President Biden has said, uh, we would do the same, and then we would use that as a platform to uh, lengthen and strengthen the agreement, working in close coordination with, uh, with our partners. Um, as Freud might have said, though, um, sometimes a nuclear deal is just a nuclear deal. Uh, that's, uh, that was at the, the heart of what we did with the JCPOA. It was not about trying to solve every problem uh, with Iran. Uh, some people believe that maybe it would have uh, an ameliorative effect on their, their conduct in other, in other places. Uh, others didn't, but the purpose of the deal was to contend with the most dangerous problem posed by Iran in terms of uh, our own interests, and that was the possibility it would require on, uh, be able to acquire on short order a nuclear weapon and then act in other areas with increasing impunity. Um, having said that, I think the benefits of coming back into uh, an agreement, if Iran does, um, uh, also can be felt in these other areas. When we um, negotiated the JCPOA, uh, we made it very clear that uh, signing the agreement uh, did not uh, relieve re Iran of its responsibilities to act uh, in an appropriate manner in other areas and did not take away any of our own abilities to um, uh, stand up to uh, Iranian misbehavior uh, in, in other areas. Uh, but what happened is this. When President Trump tore up the agreement, he also tore up unity among uh, the United States and Europe, and even uh, the unity that we'd managed to achieve with China and Russia when it came to dealing with Iran. And in so doing, he isolated the United States instead of Iran. As a result, getting cooperation from our closest partners to stand up to and stand against uh, Iranian malevolent actions in other parts of the, uh, of the region uh, basically evaporated. And even in the, in the instance of um, the uh, killing of Qasem Soleimani, again, uh, no one is shedding a tear for his demise, but a rather remarkable thing happened. Our closest partners in Europe started to draw in effect a moral equivalence between the United States and Iran, saying both of us needed to stand down. Uh, that's absolutely remarkable uh, and very deeply unfortunate. If the uh, nuclear agreement is, is resurrected, and it would not be easy to do that, but let's just say that it is, it also gives us a much greater opportunity and ability to work in solidarity with our closest partners uh, to come together again and to isolate Iran, not ourselves, when it comes to dealing with uh, Iran's actions that are a threat to uh, international peace and stability um, in the region. So I think it would have that added, uh, added benefit, but we're a long ways from, from that. Uh, and of course, uh, Sanam, you're absolutely right that um, as we were doing in the context of the JCPOA, uh, we have to do this with as much um, coordination and cooperation as possible with countries uh, in the region that are immediately uh, affected. Uh, and I believe we would uh, be able to do that. Uh, Robin, to your question about Russia, uh, it's of course one of the most daunting questions that, uh, that faces us, but I wanna bring you back uh, to 2009. The very first sort of foreign policy speech of the Obama-Biden administration was a speech delivered by Vice President Biden at Verkunda, the Munich Security Conference, in February of that year. And that was, in fact, the, the famous uh, reset speech. But what's often uh, overlooked or forgotten about that speech is, even as we were talking about the reset, even as we were talking about the fact that, at that point, <laughs> the relationship between the United States and Russia had reached a low, uh, we thought that in the interests of both countries, we could do better. Uh, and we should reset the relationship. And indeed, we did, and it did produce positive results, including uh, New START, uh, including cooperation in Afghanistan, including uh, getting Russia into the WTO. Um, but that speech also had uh, a flip side to it. And the vice president said very clearly in that speech that even as we seek uh, a reset with Russia, uh, we are not going to abandon some of our basic uh, principles. We are not going back to a world of spheres of influence. We don't accept that. It's an anachronism of the past uh, and not something that we would uh, accept. We don't accept the proposition that uh, one country can interfere 
in the affairs uh, of another, telling it what to do and what not to do, with whom it can associate and with whom it cannot associate. Uh, we don't accept the proposition that one country can violate the sovereign borders uh, of another. And all of that proved, unfortunately, very prescient when, if you fast forward, uh, we come to Ukraine. We obviously already experienced Georgia. Uh, and uh, then for a whole variety of reasons, which I won't rehearse here, uh, and grievances on the Russian side as well, uh, the relationship spiraled uh, down to, to where it is now and where, uh, where Russia remains a clear and present threat to uh, our elections in, uh, uh, in November. Look, I think um, that uh, President Putin is beginning to feel uh, some intense domestic pressures in terms of delivering for his own people. Uh, the way that uh, uh, he's been dealing with the, uh, the virus is also, I think, um, uh, creating uh, deeper distrust in the government and its institutions. Um, that's um, not necessarily a, a good thing or a bad thing. It does mean that uh, actually things could become more challenging and more dangerous if he decides that the best way to take people's minds off of problems at home is to create distractions abroad. But I think that uh, a Biden administration would be very direct, very clear, and very resolute in what we expect of Russia and what we are going to accept uh, and, uh, and not accept. And there will be a renewed clarity uh, if there's a Biden administration uh, where it's very clear that um, our interest is in working in the first and foremost with our allies and partners and friends, uh, as opposed to um, spending time uh, saying nice things about autocrats uh, and dictators. I think that clarity in and of itself would go uh, a long way to uh, writing some of the, uh, the balance. Let me say one additional thing uh, before we move on. And it relates to both Russia and China, um, uh, just to bring these together. Uh, leaving aside, again, the, the big elephant in the room, which is the coronavirus, and how we all contend with that. As Peter was saying you know, earlier, a lot of these trends were in the, uh, uh, the works well before the virus. They're going to um, uh, to outlast it as well. One of the biggest trends that we're seeing is the world, to some extent, dividing between what you might call techno-democracies on the one hand and techno-autocracies on the other hand. And if the countries in that first camp are able to find ways that we have not found yet uh, to work more closely together in, again, setting the, uh, the rules, the norms, and infusing the values into the technology that increasingly dominates our lives, uh, we will do well and hopefully bring others along. If, on the other hand, the techno-autocracies dominate that, uh, that competition, um, then I think we're going to be in a much more difficult and challenged space. And I come back to the basic starting proposition, that does not happen without US leadership and US engagement. Uh, yeah, I think you, that's a very nice comment to lead into these next couple of questions. Um, Gideon, Trisha, uh, and Amy, and and Sir David, I, I think we'll take those four, if you can be fairly succinct, um, okay. not too succinct. Uh, Gideon, you first, if you unmute yourself. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah, Gideon Rackman from the Financial Times. Yes. It is about that question of American leadership. I mean, you made a very classical case for the need for it, and I'm sure a lot of the audience would find it uh, very reassuring to hear those kinds of words, but I think there's also a kind of skepticism that that old America can ever fully come back, partly because we've seen Trump elected on an America first uh, nationalist platform and pursue it. Um, if Biden wins, would it be possible to go back to that old style of US leadership or do you at some sense have to accommodate to the fact that half the country uh, seems to be alienated from it? Uh, and Le Leslie, do you want me to uh, respond? I know, I'm or? actually going to take, I, I, you won't believe it, but we have like 16 people in the queue. So I'm, I am taking them in groups. Uh, Trisha, if, you're, if you um, unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, again, it was really on uh, the multilateral question. I mean, this pandemic obviously has uh, exposed uh, a lot of dysfunctional dysfunctionality in terms of how we govern and how we do business. But as I call the political pandemic of the last four years has really exposed a lot about the, the fault lines running through these multilateral organizations that are not serving their purpose as they once did. And I'm wondering how much of an appetite does a Biden administration have 
uh, to be a, a global re uh, leader in reform. I mean, we know that nation building is dead and gone. This is much more, less ideology, but more uh, reform, which is very difficult to do. But uh, how much of, of an impetus is there? Because this is not about patching up uh, the bad years, the last four years, as we know, we don't go back on that. So uh, your uh, thoughts on that. Uh, and Amy, Amy Pope. Do we have you, Amy, unmuted? Thanks. Hey, Amy. I'm Amy Pope. I'm a partner at Shillings. I am a fellow at Chatham House and had the very good fortune to work with Tony Blinken in the last administration. Um, really quickly, there's been so much damage done to U.S. global leadership as well as to our alliances. And I expect by the end of COVID, there's going to be even more when we talk about things like vaccine development and distribution. Is it enough that we have a change in administration or what actions would a new President Biden have to take to repair those relationships and rebuild trust? And um, Sir David. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, affiliation is Chatham House, but since Lizzie insisted I was but further than that, I should say that, like Peter, I'm a former ambassador to Washington, though much further in the back in the rearview mirror than Peter. Uh, and in my day, the vice president was on the hill and Tony was working for him there. And one of the things we used to talk about in those days was the transatlantic relationship. And I suppose my question links up a bit with Gideon's. Um, Tony, how bad do you think the damage has been to the transatlantic relationship over the last four, three, four years? And how much of a priority would it be for a Biden administration to try to repair it and reset it? Uh, and if it is a high priority, and from what you've said, it sounds as though not least on the basis of values and so on, uh, it would be. How would you go about this uh, and uh, what would be the priorities within it for you? Thank you. Uh, and, and, and so good to hear from all of you and to, uh, to see all of you. Um, uh, let, let me try and step back because I think there's a common denominator here. And I think that uh, in different ways, uh, starting especially with Gideon, you've really put your, your, your finger on um, something that's underlying uh, this moment and that uh, we can't escape. And again, in fairness to um, President Trump, <laughs> uh, many of the, the underlying problem predated him and will almost certainly uh, continue uh, when he's no longer uh, president. Although I think Arguably, from my judgment, he's been an accelerant to some of these problems. And it's this. Uh, I think the divide that we were seeing emerge uh, before the Trump administration uh, was, uh, and Gideon, you've written about this, uh, and others have written about this very eloquently, was a divide, um, not the classic divide between right and left, conservative and liberal in the American sense of the term, uh, Democrat or, or, or Republican, but increasingly a divide between um, those who, looking at the challenges we fa face around the world, believed that the best thing to do was to protect ourselves, to play defense, to get into a sort of protective crouch. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. It's, it's perfectly understandable. Uh, versus those uh, who believe that, uh, no, we needed to try to find a way to remain open and engaged and to shape these very uh, profound forces of change in ways that, that work for us or at least mitigate their downsides. In other words, it was this difference between those who looked at the future and saw it uh, as being dominated by the need to build walls and, and those who believe that it still requires building uh, bridges. And to mix metaphors uh, atrociously, there was a lot of wind in the sails of the, uh, of the wall builders that I think President Trump and other leaders uh, are a manifestation of uh, very quickly. The sheer uh, rapidity and profundity of, of change driven by technology, driven by the almost unbridled flow of information, driven by the sense that borders were eroding. That was creating among so many of our fellow citizens a sense of, of chaos, of uncertainty, of not understanding anymore how the world was working. The North Star was gone, and they were looking uh, for some restoration uh, of, uh, of just a basic sense of uh, their place in the world and, um, and what that North Star was. Second, we had at the same time uh, this paradox uh, where, on the one hand, by virtually every aggregate measure, uh, the world and our countries in particular were better off, healthier, safer, wiser, better educated, um, more tolerant. And yet, of course, uh, for so many people, not feeling the benefits of this progress. And so uh, equality among nations was growing, inequality within them was also growing. 
Uh, and that left people uh, feeling uh, frustrated and angry, uh, left out, left behind, uh, disconnected economically, disconnected uh, socially. Um, and then finally, in the midst of all of this, uh, profound changes in relationships among countries, but also uh, beyond them, uh, beneath them, with new power centers emerging, fueled by this very technology uh, and information, um, non-state actors of one kind or another, uh, sub-state actors of one kind or another, the mayor of a megacity, the uh, chieftain of a, of a major corporation, uh, super empowered groups and individuals, all of whom had much greater ability than ever before to veto the decisions that traditionally had been taken by national governments or, uh, Trisha, in the case, uh, international institutions. And that made uh, governing even more difficult in terms of delivering for people. And at the same time, uh, questions of uh, corruption, uh, hyper uh, partisanship, all of that uh, added to the mistrust of uh, traditional institutions. That creates almost a perfect storm uh, in which uh, the answers that we've seen in the past uh, are very similar to the answers we've seen now, which is the rise uh, of populism, of, uh, of xenophobia, uh, of extreme nationalism. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, people are looking, desperately looking for simple uh, answers and strength in the face of this world that they don't understand, that's angering and frustrating them, that's not delivering for them. Uh, and the, it's a long way of saying to Gideon's really, really uh, good, good question and to the other questions that I think touched on different aspects of this, that no, there is no going back uh, to the way things were to some rosy tinted uh, past. I believe there are basic uh, principles that remain constant, but if we're not able to demonstrate, for example, in the conduct of our foreign policy, that it's actually delivering for people in ways that make sense in their own lives, uh, we're not going to get their sustained support. Um, if we can't uh, bring people along and if we can't bring the different groups in our society along that have a stake in these questions, um, then they're going to um, put a wrench in the works. It's as simple as that. And that means that we really have to think differently about the way we approach things. I'll give you one very, very quick example. Um, trade. Now, on the one hand, the interesting news, at least before the virus, and I haven't seen the numbers since, is that at least in the United States, support for, for at least from my perspective, uh, support for uh, quote unquote free trade uh, what I would prefer to call fair trade, was actually rising uh, despite the protectionist moment. But here's the thing. Going forward, um, a President Biden would approach uh, these agreements in a very, very different way. Um, first, you have to invest in your own people before you uh, actually uh, do anything, making sure that they are able to compete and succeed in what is going to remain even after the virus, uh, a globalized world, maybe less, much less so than before, but it will still be with us. It's not, it's not going away. Those are the kinds of investments we used to make in very basic things, like education, like infrastructure, like healthcare, uh, like training. Um, much of that has gone away. The United States used to have um, not only the most productive workers in the world, uh, but also uh, the best educated, the best trained, um, and uh, we've dropped way down on that list. So you've got to actually invest in your own people and invest in your own infrastructure in the largest sense of the term. Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. But second, you have to have stakeholders in with you on the takeoff, not just the landing. Uh, the vice president said that, you know, in any future trade deal, for example, uh, we would have um, labor, uh, environmental experts, and other stakeholders in from the start, both in the administration itself helping to negotiate any agreements, and certainly at the table as they were being negotiated, not just handing off a fait accompli after a negotiation and expecting people uh, to support it. That world is gone, it can't be sustained, and it shouldn't be sustained. So it's a long way of saying that um, we do need new approaches. We do need to think of things in ways that bring people along. We do need to think about how every action we take abroad actually works for uh, our people at home. The work in multilateral institutions, <laughs> as you know, is painful, painstaking, laborious, um, but it really is vitally important because what we do know from this virus is something we've known for a long time, but it's now been accentuated, which is that the weakest link in a chain uh, is going to be a problem for everyone. And virtually every major challenge we face has absolutely no respect for borders. Uh, and no single country acting alone, 
even the United States uh, can effectively deal with many of these challenges uh, alone. Uh, there is an imperative now greater than it's ever been on finding ways to cooperate and coordinate uh, in order to face challenges that are going to come and bite each of us at home, uh, no matter how high a wall we put up. So uh, I think we have to do it. And part of life, um, 90 percent, as has been said, is showing up. At the very least, we would show up again. At the very least, we would get caught uh, trying. Uh, I think uh, all of this also permeates the relationship uh, across the Atlantic. Um, but, you know, especially in times of trouble and turmoil and challenge, the first thing you do, in my judgment, is you shore up your own base. You strengthen your own foundation. And for the United States, that foundation, that base, uh, starts uh, with Europe, and it starts with the world's democracies. When we are working together, when we are cooperating, when we're coordinating, we are much stronger than when we are going it alone. And that's why uh, the worst aspect of America First is that it has become America alone, and that's a disservice to our own interests. Tony, I, I'm hoping you might have time for one more round of questions. And we're coming to the end. We have a lot of questions still on the table. I, I'm going to first um, uh, say I have a very a lovely note from somebody we're all very fond of and would never not read out the question. That is our director, Robin Niblett, says, I hope that we will get a question on what the Biden administration would expect from Boris Johnson and the British government, especially if Boris Johnson falls out with the EU in December. So that will be the first question uh, and, and a, absolutely a critical one for this audience um, and, and the right one for Robin to raise. But I wanna come to Adam Isaacs, John Prideau, my colleague, uh, Chris Sabatini, and then, and then Lindsay, and, um, and then we'll come back to you. So Adam, if you introduce yourself, I don't, I don't think we've met actually, if you unmute yourself and uh, hello, uh, my name's Adam Isaacs. I'm in charge of the European Parliament's Transatlantic Relations Unit. Um, and Robin's question is very much along the lines of mine, which is what might we expect from a Biden policy towards the EU? And what, how is it thought to navigate um, that relationship in view of potential difficulties from the British government coming up? But Robin uh, phrased it much more eloquently. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and John? Hi, Leslie. Thank you. I'm John Prado. I'm the US editor at The Economist. I have a short question, which is, I'd like to know how former Vice President Biden's views of China have changed since he left office. Um, Chris. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Chris Sabatini. I'm the Senior Research Fellow for Latin America at, the Ch at Chatham House. I, uh, I work, Tony, with uh, um, Juan Gonzalez and with uh, Mark Fierstein on the Cuba issue uh, when uh, you successfully pushed through very important changes that were since rolled back. My question really is about the policy towards Venezuela now. The White House is trying to leverage the COVID-19 crisis uh, or threat and the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela uh, to force political change through offering to lighten its sanctions, uh, ones that you did not impose. Um, what, it, what, what, what does this mean for Venezuela? How would a Biden approach differ for Venezuela? And I should add, I'm still in communication regularly with Mark and Juan on other matters. So good to see you. Thanks. I'm actually going to sneak a couple more in here. Lindsay and then and then Sophie from Schwartzman College. Lindsay from Chatham House. Hi, Lindsay Newman, as Leslie said, Senior Research Fellow on the U.S. Americas Program with Leslie and Chris. Um, thank you so much for the time today. And I really appreciate how you contextualize this as one of the most dangerous periods uh, in recent in recent history. I just wanted to point us towards another um, area that we haven't yet touched on, which is the uncertainty around future leadership with North Korea, and um, you know what what a Biden policy ha had intended to look like um, uh, if it had been Kim Jong Un, or per perhaps with the the developing uncertainty. And what do you see as sort of the risks, but also potentially the opportunities there with that relationship? Thank you so much. Um, and Sophie, are you with us from? Schwarzman College. Pardon my tech difficulties here in Hong Kong. Thank you so much for your time. Um, my name is Sophie Zinzer. I'm a Schwarzman scholar and I study um, US-China Middle East relations. Um, so my question is about Syria. Um, there was a panel at Chatham House last week that talked about um, the increasing, uh, WFP announced the increasing number of um, folks this year who are going to be in severe acute malnutrition um, and very close to 
that level, especially uh, with a focus on Syria as well. So I'd love to hear a little bit about Biden's uh, policy strategy in terms of working with or um, sort of for U.S. interests in the Middle East on um, alleviating some of the direct challenges that international um, countries are going to face given uh, these increasing restrictions. Thank you so much. All right, Tony, I think back to you. Um, and Peter, you've been tremendously, I know you have a lot to say about Iran. You've shared your views and your deep thinking with us over um, the last few years. I know you've been silent. I don't know if you want to add anything, but um, Tony, why don't you... Um, I thought I'd let Peter answer all of these questions. <laughs> Be a good way to, hard good way to end. Um, look, I think it's impossible to do justice to these uh, terrific questions in the, the short amount of time we have. I'll just touch on them briefly with apologies because uh, each one of them deserves uh, a more uh, a thorough answer than I can give in the time that we've got uh, allotted. But very, very quickly, just on the UK and the, and the EU, um, on one level, it's pretty simple. Uh, from the perspective of, um, uh, of a potential Biden administration, uh, they remain, whatever the relationship between the two, foundational partners for the United States. Uh, and the infamous um, special relationship doesn't go away one way uh, or the other. Again, I think there's a greater imperative than there's ever been on uh, the world's leading democracies, finding ways to work together, um, thinking together about the challenges that we're facing within our own societies, because there are a lot of common denominators, as well as the challenges that we're facing coming uh, from outside. And in that effort, um, uh, the, uh, the UK is, um, remains uh, the great partner. And the EU, from my perspective and from the Vice President's perspective, is uh, an absolutely vital partner as well. Um, none of this is easy. None of this is simple. Uh, none of this is smooth. But um, it, it still comes back to that basic uh, proposition. With regard to China and the Vice President's views, actually, I think if you go back, uh, for example, to a speech he made in 2015 at the Strategic and Economic Dialogue uh, that uh, then existed between the United States and China, uh, his views have been uh, pretty uh, consistent about the need uh, for what you might call responsible uh, competition. Um, and he's had deep engagement with China in over many years, including in recent years. I talked earlier about the uh, relationship with Xi Jinping, the amount of time that the vice president spent grappling with uh, these issues. So I think he has a very um, clear-eyed uh, understanding, a clear-eyed view uh, of China about the challenge that it poses, uh, the competition that it poses, uh, but also uh, the uh, need to try to find ways uh, to work productively together uh, where we can in our own interests and also in, in the interests of the, uh, of the world. But I'd invite you, for example, to go back to what he said in, um, in 2015. Um, with regard to Venezuela, uh, again, very quickly, I think the, the mistake that the administration, the Trump administration has made, is that it ratcheted up the issue in very dramatic ways and then put all its chips on the proposition that the military was going to turn on Maduro. And when that didn't happen, we were left not holding any cards and not having a hand to play. I would just say very simply that one of the uh, ways we would approach this is working much more cooperatively with other countries uh, in the region and having um, a much more common and coordinated approach to dealing with Venezuela, as well as trying to show more solidarity. For example, uh, refugees from Venezuela who are placing a burden uh, on Colombia uh, and other countries, that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, giving temporary protected status to Venezuelans in the United States should have happened uh, a long time ago. Uh, but um, we need to be looking as well at the way sanctions are being uh, conducted and what, uh, to look at ways to make it, uh, if possible, less of a burden on the Venezuelan people and more of a burden on those who are sustaining uh, the regime. And there are ways to do that, again, in coordination with others. But that deserves a much lengthier answer. But in the interest of time, let me stop there. Um, <laughs> the uh, North Korea uh, question, also uh, a profound challenge. That's one of the uh, non-COVID dogs that um, I think uh, has the potential to bark. Uh, it, has only, it's a, it was a daunting problem to begin with. I don't want to minimize the difficulty that the Trump administration uh, had in, in dealing with North Korea, uh, but at the same time, an already uh, bad problem, I think, has been made worse. The um, very, very high-profile symmetry between President Trump and Kim Jong-un uh, basically uh, gave Kim Jong-un international legitimacy and even more domestic legitimacy by putting him on par with the President of the United States, and we got absolutely nothing in return. Uh, to the contrary, the North Koreans have moved even further forward 
uh, with uh, producing uh, materials and, and warheads for their nuclear uh, arsenal, uh, as well as uh, advancing their missile program. Uh, so this problem uh, come next January is only going to be worse. There were things we were doing at the end of the uh, Obama-Biden administration that I think were starting to show some effect, both in terms of bringing China along to help us contend with the, the problem, but also uh, other countries working very closely with South Korea uh, and Japan to, uh, for example, um, find and stop virtually any uh, economic, uh, diplomatic, political connection that North Korea had with other countries in the world. For example, guest workers bringing in uh, hundreds of millions of dollars back to uh, North Korea as a means of putting uh, the right kind of pressure on North Korea uh, to negotiate. Um, so there are things that we can do, uh, but uh, I don't want to minimize the difficulty of the, of the problem. And of course, as you say, we also don't know the status of the, um, of the regime in Kim Jong-un right now. Finally, on Syria, uh, let me say that, you know, uh, as someone who dealt with Syria policy in the last administration, um, I feel an acute sense of responsibility because um, you have to look yourself in the mirror and acknowledge that we failed. And uh, many, many lives have been lost. Many have been internally displaced. Many have been made refugees. Uh, and that's something I will carry with me for um, uh, forever. The problem is even more acute now, uh, particularly in that pocket in Northwestern Syria uh, and Idlib, where so many people are concentrated together, uh, being pressed uh, from all sides. And now when all of that is happening, uh, the virus is descending uh, upon them as well. Uh, we still have a little bit of leverage left in Syria, not much, but a little. We still have some forces in the Northeast that happen to be near the oil. That's a point of leverage. Um, not that we should be uh, owning the oil, as President Trump said, but uh, because they're in a place that uh, matters to the regime, uh, we can uh, at least leverage that and any departure uh, for progress on um, alleviating conditions in Idlib, uh, al allowing humanitarian assistance in, uh, and um, uh, moving forward with some kind of political transition. Uh, that leverage is there. We have another kind of leverage. Syria would need massive rebuilding and reconstruction. We have a greater ability than anyone to mobilize the international community in that direction, uh, but we should be making it absolutely clear that the only way uh, we would do that uh, is if the situation in Idlib uh, is, um, is different, uh, if there is humanitarian access, uh, if uh, there is uh, the beginnings at least of a, of a political transition, uh, if we can start to see uh, more local uh, governance, for example, um, all of that needs to be on the table. I, I don't want to exaggerate. Uh, President Trump has given up much of what limited leverage we had, but there's still a little bit of it left. And at the very least, we would do our best to uh, use it and to show up and see if we could help uh, alleviate some of the worst excesses of the situation there. That is an extraordinary amount of uh, terrain that you've covered. Um, just about every continent, uh, most of the major conflicts, and of course the transatlantic relationship and uh, what America means for the UK. And as you said, the elephant in the room, um, which I think is in, you know, we hope not in any of our rooms, but we're all guarding against it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I want to invite, uh, Peter and Robin to just say, you know, a word uh, of thank you directly to you before I sign off, because I think that, you know, having, having you speak to us, um, we would have been trying to get you one way or the other. Uh, and the fact that you've made the time, I know you have, I now know that you have two, um, I'm sure very beautiful young people in your life mm -hmm. and, uh, and, a, and a host of invitations and, and offers. So it, it's wonderful that you've done this. It means a tremendous amount to us. I think that you can see that we have grave concerns, all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so having the conversation um, and, and having some concrete answers to how, how things might progress is very important. But Peter, perhaps you could say a word and then Robin um, before we close. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Very briefly, and not only thank you to Tony, but thank you for struggling through having a cold as well as all your other commitments. So much appreciated. I have just, I think, two comments. One, that I thought you were very eloquent in the way in which you addressed mainly Gideon's question about how does political leadership reconnect with what people really care about, given what we've all been through, given populism, given the sense of rejection there has been of existing political elites. And I think you, you did that beautifully. I would love to say that as we, as we look to the future, wouldn't it be nice to see political leadership also addressing such old fashioned principles as accountability, respect for the rule of law, independent judiciary, telling the truth, 
institutional independence, uh, and indeed the importance of a free press. That may not be actually what public opinion is crying out for, but I would add it to my little list, partly because I think those are not very far removed from the principles which, for example, uh, a Vice President Biden believes in, but I think otherwise the chances of the, the Western world retaining any sort of moral leadership and giving itself the right to call out other people when they behave badly will be gone forever. And I just think that's an important part of it. My second little point is just to say, uh, a personal comment, which you will understand, in all this discussion, and thank you for covering so much territory, we haven't talked about Turkey, which is a country which I used to talk to you and to the Vice President about, a country I'm very fond of, I spent many years of my life there. Uh, somehow we missed out. Uh, I suspect that things would be a little bit different because I do recall uh, that the Vice President spent a lot of time engaging personally with President Erdogan when he mm. was in office, and who knows how that would go. It's super complex, and many of the difficulties in that relationship are... Uh, need to be addressed on both sides, if not on many different sides. And some of it's related to Syria and some of it's related to Russia and other parts of the world. But it's a little gap in our analysis. Maybe for next time, Tony, we can talk about that. But otherwise, really just to say what a joy to be with you again, talking to you again. Uh, and thank you so much for sparing the time. And thank you, everybody else who's tuned in. And we hope that you've had a, a useful hour and a quarter with us. And Robin. So, oh, Tony, I'll be very quick because I don't know what we're keeping you from. Um, I would simply say your remarks have reminded me, at least, uh, of the great professionalism as well as knowledge uh, and encyclopedic knowledge that you bring about international affairs and how to fit it together with the U.S. and with U.S. power. Um, so it's just been a real joy to listen to your uh, tour of the horizon. But I, one thing I did want to say is I thought your closing remark about Syria reminded us that you bring a humanity to foreign policy as well. And there's not many people who would recognize how that particular tragedy has affected you personally through the time you had there and how you feel about it to this day. And I think that sense of uh, emotional engagement is one that um, um, I hope we get to be able to take advantage of again as, as Britain, as the world, and hopefully the United States as well, um, if the time is right. I don't want to say more than that. I will simply say a big, big thank you. And if Leslie is not taking us back, I always wish we could say thank you to people properly by like unmuting. Yeah, um, actually, why don't we? Time. Everybody would unmute. Please unmute. Would like to unmute all of you, uh, whether you have a video or not, and join us in, in applauding Tony Blinken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great, great to be with so many friends. Uh, great to be at Chatham House. Any opportunity I get to Zoom over to London, I take. <laughs> we we'll try to bring you bricks, bricks and mortar uh, when we get through this. this Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.